Hello and welcome to a triumphant and tea timey sail proof car review. Sitting right behind me is a 1978 Triumph Spitfire and it's a British sports car that to me looks like a metric load of fun. Today we're going to learn about the history of Triumph, we're going to look around this Spitfire that's behind me here, then we're going to determine if it's a good investment just by buying and maintaining it. Do you enjoy sail proof car reviews? If so, please be sure to subscribe by clicking the watermark in the lower right corner of the screen and click the bell notification for a friendly reminder each time a new sailproof car review comes out. In our video review of the Sterling 825, we did mention Triumph as a brand that was involved in the British Motor Corporation slash Austin Rover corporate mergers, but we didn't really expand on it too much. Here's a brief history of the Triumph brand and the Triumph Spitfire. Triumph has roots in England dating all the way back to 1885 when a German businessman started importing bicycles of all things from around Europe and reselling them in London under his own trade name. This ultimately led to the Triumph trade name being adopted, and it also ultimately led to the company producing their own bicycles as opposed to importing bicycles from the rest of Europe. In 1902, Triumph started producing their first motorcycles, which they still produce to this day. And later, in 1923, Triumph started producing their first car, the 10-20, or 1020, upon acquiring the little-known Dawson Motor Corporation. Spoiler alert, this video has mergers and acquisitions as well. After modest sales success with its first car, the 1020, Triumph produced their successor to the 1020, which was the Triumph Super 7, pictured here. Fast forward to 1930, and Triumph realized that they couldn't quite compete with Austin and Morris Motor Companies for the mass market, so after a rebranding, they decided to focus more on expensive cars, and it actually paid off, until it didn't because a few short years later in the mid-1930s, Triumph ran into financial trouble, and then by the late 1930s, they put their factory up for sale. The late 1930s was also the start of World War II. Talk about fantastic timing. In fact, it wasn't until late 1944 when Triumph was finally able to sell what was left of the company to Standard Motor Company, and then with the new management and the new ownership came a new style, and so all the pre-war models that were a bit more opulent and luxurious they put the kibosh on those, and then they decided to start an entire new lineup in 1946. For sake of branding, the lighter weight, more sporty cars were branded as Triumph, and then the more luxurious cars were branded as Standard, although there was a bit of inconsistent crossover between the two at times, but nonetheless, this theme seemed to carry for quite a while. So fast forward to 1962, when the very first Triumph Spitfire was introduced to the market, and then not too long after, in 1963, is when the Leyland buyout happened, and that was the beginning of the end for Triumph. Because unfortunately, during the time that Leyland took over, there were so many mergers and so many acquisitions, and there were so many cost-cutting measures that really, even when there were resources available, the company simply wasn't utilizing them well. In fact, Triumph went out of their way to build a 100,000 car per year factory, and yet they only built about 30,000 cars per year out of this new factory they built. There were even times when Triumph tested new vehicle systems, essentially by trial and error with their customers, which usually isn't a recipe for success. This resulted in many unreliable vehicles being built, and ultimately the reputation of Triumph basically going down the drain. And then sadly, in 1984, Triumph cars ceased to exist. So where does the Spitfire fit in all of this? Well, the Spitfire started selling in 1962, like we previously mentioned, sold all the way until 1980, had three major redesigns, so there were four body styles total, and the formula for the car remained largely unchanged. Front engine, rear drive, manual four-speed, Italian-designed, lightweight, and affordable car. In fact, the heaviest of the Triumph Spitfires, which is the one behind me here, is still lighter weight than my Yugo. I can push that car to top speed, and I don't work out. So this 1978 Triumph Spitfire sitting behind me here was among the last and best selling of the Triumph Spitfires. Now we're going to show you around it and show you some of its oddities. First on the walk around of the Triumph Spitfire, I just want to talk about the profile of this car because it's small. In fact, it's really small. If you remember our video with the Nash Metropolitan that we filmed a few weeks ago, that car had an 85-inch wheelbase, which was the smallest wheelbase that we have reviewed at that point. This car has an 83-inch wheelbase, which is really tiny. 
Not only that, but the car is incredibly lightweight. I was mentioning that this car is about as light as my Yugo, and this was the heavier iteration. This car is just over 1,800 pounds. The very first Triumph Spitfire that came out was just over 1,500 pounds, which it's incredibly light. I'm actually yeah. standing here with the owner, Bill Holmes. How are you, Bill? I'm doing great, how are you? Good, good, it's a beautiful car you have. I bought this 1978 Triumph Spitfire in 2018. We bought it in Redmond, Oregon. We believe it's been a Central Oregon car its entire life because unique to this car, there is no rust on it. And that is something that uh, does plague these cars. It was resprayed in pumpkin orange. Yeah. Uh, also features electronic overdrive as well as a redone wood dash, yeah. uh, Monza exhaust, and a few other uh, unique accoutrements. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Mount Lake Triumph, uh, that's Mount Lake underscore Triumph, for this car, uh, as well as many others uh, in, in and around the British car world. It's a fantastic car. It fits me perfectly. Yeah. Uh, it is a small, tiny car, but in terms of connection, from car to the road and from driver to car, yeah. uh, you really don't get much closer than this. You will feel every bump uh, and every turn, and it <laughs> is uh, just an excellent representation yeah, of the uh, pure driving experience. This is really perfect for a city car, yeah. uh, something to tool around town with, uh, something to take to cars and coffee, to, yeah. uh, to zip around mm -hmm. uh, on a light sunny day. Um, it, it really is a fantastic, uh, you know, car for someone looking to get into the vintage car yeah. community. So it's got a Weber carb conversion kit. Uh, the, the Weber carburetors were uh, a little bit more consistent. It's got a Monza exhaust, which makes it sound great. <laughs> This is well maintained, it's garage kept. Fluids and any type of maintenance are always done on a regular schedule. Yeah, um, yeah. It's now really dialed in. We're looking for 6,500 for the car. Really looking for someone that is also going to have a whole lot of fun and be able to love this car. Also think about it guys, you could spend 6,500 bucks on a more ubiquitous Mazda Miata or you could own a beautiful Triumph Spitfire like this one here. Next on our walk around of the Triumph Spitfire, we have to talk about how you open the hood for this car because it's a little bit more unique than any of the other cars that we've reviewed. You'll notice that there's this little metallic looking latch that's right here. There's one on each side of the car. You have to pull those up and then you actually pull the entire hood up. So it's not just the hood, it's also the fenders integrated in with one gigantic body panel. So it reveals the entire engine underneath. And I really love this design. This is actually a common design on more racing themed cars because it makes it so easy to work on the engine. And it's also one giant panel. So there's really a lot less room for error when it comes to gaps in the body. And right next to the two metallic latches where you unlatch them and open the hood, I wanted to talk about these wheels. This is one of two major wheel designs that you saw on the Triumph Spitfire of this era. This one is actually a painted steel wheel and it's believed that it's the original wheel on the car which is really amazing considering the age of the vehicle. But one thing I wanted to point out is the sheer size of the wheel, again, to highlight that profile of how small the car is. These are 13 inch wheels, which 13 inches is the same size as the Honda Beat and the Suzuki Cappuccino that we previously reviewed a couple of years ago. That just gives you an idea of how small the car is. And while we're still talking about the wheels on the Triumph Spitfire, I wanted to mention something about the actual height of the wheel in between the wheel and the bumper, because you'll notice it seems a little bit lopsided in the sense that the front seems raised, and that's actually not your imagination. See, back when this car was brand new, cars that went to the US, they had to follow certain federal rules, and one federal rule was a certain minimum required ground clearance, and so in order to get around it, Triumph actually raised the front end of the car about two inches, and theoretically, the car would be safer during five mile per hour crashes or better, so that the bumper didn't necessarily go under a larger raised bumper. Now, there are some aftermarket kits where you can lower this to the originally intended height that you see on the British cars, but either way, it's an interesting tip bit that I just thought I'd point out on this car. And, and whether the car is actually safer or not is really up to debate because this car weighs about 1,800 pounds and this is one of the heavier iterations versus there are Dodge Rams that weigh close to six to 7,000 pounds that could probably crush this thing, but that's beside the point. 
Next on our walk around of the Spitfire, I wanted to talk about this feature in the back, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually not a bad feature if you wanted to add some user friendliness to the car, and that would be this luggage rack. Now, the reason I say it's counterintuitive is because the Spitfire is intended to be a two-person lightweight sports car, and a luggage rack implies that you add some heavier luggage to the back of the car. Now, I could be totally wrong on this, and this could just be an ingenious way to really add extra downforce to the back wheels of the car, but, it just seems counterintuitive to have a luggage rack on the car, which is really designed to basically get lost in without too much luggage. Speaking of getting lost, the fuel cap design on the Triumph Spitfire is among one of the best ones I've ever seen designed on a car. It's very sturdy, it's very simple. You simply pop it open like so, and pop it closed, and it latches. I really like it. Now we're moving on to the interior of the Spitfire, and I want to say this interior is absolutely beautifully done. Now, it is a two-person interior as opposed to a four-person interior, so from a practicality standpoint, it's not the most useful, but it's actually very comfortable, even for someone of my size. I'm about 5'11 and 200-ish pounds, and I actually fit in here very comfortably. The seats are nice and supple. The dashboard was replaced in this vehicle, the wooden part, and this was custom made by the owner himself, and he did a really, really nice job actually matching it um, to the look of the car when it was original. The gauges themselves are very easy to read, and they're very well laid out. You have your hazard lights right in the center, You'll notice that there's this little green light that's off to the left of the speedometer, and that green light is a turn signal indicator, and that'll let you know if either your left or your right turn signal is on. One of the oddities that I love about this car is the fastened seatbelt light literally says, Fasten Belts. One thing that you'll notice on the shifter is it is a four-speed transmission, and then you'll notice that there's this little switch that's at the top, and that little switch is actually what you use to activate the overdrive for third and fourth gear, which allows you to rev the engine a little bit lower and really cruise at freeway speeds. I really love that the climate controls are actually pretty well laid out in terms of they actually spell out car, defrost, pull, and max. One thing that I found interesting that I have not seen in a car before is a pull feature where you can actually pull it and it'll boost the power of the defrosting or the heating in the car. So there you have it. That is a walk around of a 1978 Triumph Spitfire. Now, is it a good investment or is it sale proof? First, we're gonna judge the Spitfire on its awareness, which is how often are people really searching for this car? Or how often are they really aware of its existence? And I would say it's actually about average with some of the other cars. It's better than some of the more recent cars that I reviewed. So it's gonna earn a five out of 10 in this category. Next, we're gonna judge the Triumph Spitfire on its appearance, which is how good looking is the car? And this is a great looking car. It's classic and beautifully designed. It's a little bit small for my personal taste, but either way, it's still gonna earn a strong seven out of 10 in this category. Next, we're gonna judge the Spitfire on its appeal, which is how appealing is this car to not only an enthusiast, but also an everyday driver? And this car is a load of fun, top-down, fuel efficient. It appeals to a wide variety of people, so it earns a seven out of 10 in this category. Finally, we're gonna judge the Spitfire on its attainability, which is how easy is it to acquire? Now, they sold about 95,000 of this particular body style worldwide, and they sold many more of them of the other body styles, and you can acquire them for fairly inexpensively. In fact, this one is for sale for $6,500 if you wanna make it yours, so it's gonna earn a six out of 10 in this category. So add it all up, and the total score out of 40 is 25, making the Triumph Spitfire a reasonably solid investment. So if you're looking for a car to have fun in that you could actually make some money on if you held onto it and just maintained it, then consider something like this Triumph Spitfire behind us here. was built by Austin Motors, which happened to be involved in the whole Leyland conglomerate cluster F that we talk about. And right next to the two metallic latches that open up the hood, oh, the bee just flew right in front of the camera and I saw it. <laughs> so this is the reason why nudists hate this car, because you have a luggage rack that could have been saved if they just took it off and didn't have to carry all the clothes and toiletries from the house with them, really. Really?